Hello everyone, welcome to the class. Today we will talk about uh, diffraction from rectangular aperture. Now in module 9 we talked about Fresnel half period zone and then, then I introduce you a, a very nice graphical method which is called vibration curve and then we implemented this knowledge of vibration curve in circular obstacle and then we discussed about zone plates. Now proceeding ahead, today uh, we will uh, deal rectangular aperture from the uh, this graphical perspective. Now this rectangular aperture as uh, you already know since we are in the Fresnel diffraction uh, regime, we will deal this rectangular aperture uh, through uh, vibration curve and we will also talk about Fresnel integrals. Now the rectangular aperture is shown here in the this right figure schematically and uh, uh, associated with this uh, capital sigma plane of the aperture is coordinate system and the y axis of the coordinate system is pointing in this direction while the z axis is pointing in the vertical direction. The origin is situated right at the center of the rectangular aperture. Now the rectangular aperture in horizontal direction is uh, extending from point y1 to point y2 while in the vertical direction its extent is from point z1 to point z2. A source which is at a distance rho naught is illuminating this aperture and the point of observation p is at a is situated at a distance r naught from point o the origin which is at the center of the aperture. Now we here we also consider uh, area element ds which is uh, situated at some arbitrary point a and the coordinate of this arbitrary point a is yz as shown here in this figure. Now the disturbance which would be uh, regarded at point p it will come from the point sources the secondary sources which are situated at the area element ds and we know how to calculate this disturbance we have done it many times in our previous lecture. This disturbance will be given by equation number 45 where DEP represents the disturbance observed, observed at point of observation P due to the area element DS. K theta is obliquity factor, epsilon A is the strength per unit area of aperture source, R is uh, the distance which is shown here, the R is the separation between the point A and the point of observation P and rho plus r is the separation between the source and the point of observation p. Yeah, the, the, the light is coming from s to a and then it is going to p. Therefore, in with k we have rho plus r. Okay. And epsilon a is the source strength per unit area. Therefore, we will have to multiply it with ds to get the complete strength, uh, the right strength of the source. Okay, and thus equation number 45 represents the optical disturbance at P due to the area element ds okay, or due to the secondary sources situated at area element ds. Now from the last lecture we know that epsilon a rho lambda is equal to epsilon naught. Okay. This we studied while studying a uh, vibration curve. Okay. This, this is the relation which we found from there. Now if you substitute the epsilon a in previous expression using this equation, then the field get modified like this, sorry it is a deep DEP. Yeah. Now in the case where the dimensions of the aperture are small in comparison to rho naught and r naught, then we can safely substitute k theta is equal to n. Why? because if this aperture dimension is very small as compared to the aperture to observation point distance, then the angle subtended by, by the point sources situated at the aperture on the point of observation p, it would be almost equal to 0. Okay. And under this assumptions k theta, the obliquity factor would be 1. Okay. And we also assume that 1 by 
rho into r is also equal to 1 by rho naught r naught which is the correct assumption and this assumption but make it a point that this assumption is only true as long as this replacement is happening only in the amplitude part not in the phase part okay and thus if we do this replacement in the amplitude coefficient the field would be uh, almost unaffected now consider two triangles triangles soa and poa okay this is uh, the soa triangle this is the first triangle and this is the second triangle poa now in these two triangle we just apply the pythagoras theorem and we can write this relation where y and z is the coordinate of point a situated on the aperture and r is equal to square root of r naught square root of y square plus z square. Now, we exercise binomial expansion with these two expressions, the equation, expressions 47 and 48 and then add them up and the addition gives equation number 49. Now, you see that in equation 46, we have rho plus r in the phase part. Okay. Now, we, this rho plus r we can replace with equation number 49. Now, now apart from this in the amplitude part we have rho into r which can be replaced by rho naught into r naught which is a constant term yeah. and this is what we did here. Okay. Now, if we want to calculate the field due to whole area of the aperture we have to perform integration since it is uh, the aperture is has some area therefore, we will perform double integration one along y and the other along z. Okay. And rho plus r would be replaced by equation number 49. Okay. Now, after the replacement we introduce two new variables u and v okay, and these are defined by equation number 51 and 52. Now, after substituting 51 and 52 back into equation 50, we get this big expression. Now, here u dependent term r in this integration and the v dependent term are terms are there in this integration and make it a point u is related to y while v is related to z and if you go in the first figure you see you see that z is the vertical axis and y is the horizontal axis therefore u is in the horizontal direction while v would be in the vertical direction now with this we will have to evaluate equation number 53 and the major difficulty in evaluating equation number 53 is solving these two integrals now, the terms in front of the integral in equation 53 represents the unobstructed disturbance at p divided by 2. Yeah, this term, if you look it closely, then you see that it is nothing but the field due to an unobstructed disturbance, okay, which is situated at a distance rho naught plus r naught from the point of observation we have a point source s here and we have observer here and if this distance is rho naught plus r naught the field at p would be given by uh, e to the power i k rho naught plus r naught minus omega t this is the phase part and here it is the field strength by rho naught plus r naught this is the field due to unobstructed source which is at a distance rho naught plus r naught from point of observation p and this field is halved here yeah you you are, see, you are seeing that we have uh, let us say that it is eu okay and we have a extra term in the denominator which is 2 okay therefore we call it eu by 2 eu tilde by 2 okay the amplitude part in the previous expression which is a field due to an unobstructed point source. Now, the difficulty solving the integrals 
the integrals itself can be evaluated using two functions. Okay, now, we introduce two functions first is zeta which is function of w and second function is f which is function of again w okay, where w represents either u or v okay, u and u or v are introduced in equation number 51 and 52. Okay. Now, here we have two function two integrals one is u dependent other is v dependent and uh, to solve this integral we are introducing two uh, new functions zeta and f which are functions of w and w is nothing but it is either u or v. Now, these quantities which are known as Fresnel integrals are defined by this relation equation number 54 and equation number 55 these are called Fresnel integrals. Okay. Now, you see that in this expression we have integration of cos pi w prime square by 2 dw prime where the limit of integration varies from 0 to w. And if you compare it with this expression then you see that these integrals are nothing but complex representation of equation number 54 or equation number 55. Okay. In 54 we have cosine term while in 55 we have sine term and this is the only difference between eta and f. Now, both functions have been extensively studied and their numerical values are well tabulated okay? and you can find the uh, numerical values of these two functions in table 10.3 in a book by E. Hecht and A. R. Ganeshan and the title of the book is Optics. Okay? Now, their interest to us at this point derives from the fact that this function can be or this integral can be written as zeta plus i f. Okay. The integral which is uh, here in equation number 53 they can be expressed since uh, you see that here in the exponent you have iota it is a complex function therefore, it, uh, the, it, it, the solution will be complex the after if you solve this integral you will have a complex number. Okay, and if the complex number will have a real part and a imaginary part then let us assume that we will have a real part and imaginary part as zeta and f function of this integral and this is how this zeta and f are defined. Okay. Zeta is real part of this integral therefore, in zeta you have cos term while f is imaginary part therefore, you have sine term here in f in the expression of f. Okay, sine comes here and co cosine comes here. Okay, therefore, cos uh, pi w prime square by 2 will be embedded here in zeta function and similarly sine will be here in f function okay, which is quite obvious and, and therefore, the equation 53 can be rewritten in terms of uh, these two new functions zeta and f and uh, if you uh, remove this integral which are there in equation number 53 with zeta and f you get new expression for the disturbance at p which is written here where u1 and u2 and v1 and v2 are limits of the two integrals respectively. Okay. In the first bracket we have zeta and f which are functions of u while in the second bracket these are functions of v. Okay. We will have to just evaluate zeta and f in equation 57 to get the expression for uh, field E p. Now, the equation 57 the previous equation can be evaluated using tabulated value of zeta u 1, zeta u 2 and f u 1, f u 2 and uh, so on. Yeah. And these tabulated values are given in as I said before in the book optics by E. Hecht and A. R. Kanishan and the table number is 10.3. Yeah. And these are the very standard integrals which that is zeta and f are very standard integral and you can uh, see them in any standard book. The mathematics becomes rather involved if we compute the disturbance at all points of the plane of observation. Okay, because till now we have calculated we have an aperture plane and we have a screen plane and we are calculating the field at some point in the screen plane. 
but if you want to calculate the field at all the points in the screen plane then the mathematics would be very much involved okay it would be too much it will impose too much difficulty okay now in a state what people do is that they fix the axis the source is here the o is, the origin o is situated at the center of the aperture and the p is a point on the observation plane and what people do is that they fix this sop line okay and then they imagine that instead of moving point p in the screen plane they move the aperture through small displacements in aperture plane okay they only move the aperture and therefore the value of the field or irradiance at the point of observation which is fixed in the screen plane it will change okay it is like scanning the aperture and once you scan the aperture you will come to know the off axis field okay and this has the effect of translating the origin o with respect to the fixed aperture and there by scanning the pattern over the point p okay and this approach therefore is more appropriate to the incident plane waves okay because the plane wave illuminates the uh, irradiance uniformly yeah while if you launch a, a spherical wave then there would be a phased uh, difference on uh, illumination yeah the center part of the aperture would be illuminated earlier because you know so this if this is the aperture and this is the wave which is illuminating the aperture then this part will be illuminated earlier while this part would be later because there is a difference there, there is a time difference between the illumination of the central part and this part because of the curvature of the uh, wave front okay therefore this appro approach is more suited for plane wave illumination yeah now assume that e not is the amplitude of the incoming plane wave now assume that we are launching the plane wave with amplitude e not on the uh, aperture and therefore the uh, equation one which we studied in our previous uh, lectures which evaluates the the field contribution due to the elementary area ds now becomes this dep would be e not k theta by r lambda cos k r minus omega t okay since the illumination is by plane wave you see that here with k we are getting only r no rho okay because for plane wave we know rho is infinity uh, and e not by lambda is source strength epsilon a yeah here too we get a new expression for the variable u and v which are given by equation number 59 and this new expression we got from this these two expression equation number 51 and 52 in equation 51 and 52 the illumination was due to uh, a wave coming from a point source now in, in this second case the there are plane waves which are illuminating the aperture therefore what we will do is that we will divide equation number 51 as well as 52 by rho naught and after uh, division we will equate rho naught to infinity now you can see here if you divide 51 with uh, both numerator and denominator of 51 by rho naught then you get this 1 plus r naught by rho naught whole to the power half here in the numerator and here you will get this and if you now say that rho naught is infinity that is for plane wave then this term would be equal to 0 and what you, you are left with is y 2 by lambda r naught square root okay and this is what you see here in equation number 59 okay both u and v reduces to these new expressions okay now we will calculate the total field at point of observation p due to the whole aperture and uh, that this would be and once this is done then we calculate irradiance at, at p the irradiance would be given by e p tilde into e p tilde star by 2 and once the expression for e p is known we can say uh, clearly uh, easily write the expression for i p that is irradiance at p which is given by equation number 60 okay now if you go back then here it is the expression for e p 
okay. Now, in this expression 57, only the expression for u and v are modified because the illumination is now plane wave. You, if you take the complex conjugate of E p and then multiply the E p with its complex conjugate, you get this, you get uh, expression 60. Okay. And here I u is the unobstructed irradiance at point of observation p, okay, which is nothing but in equation 57 E u is a mod of E u square. Okay. Now, we can approach the limiting case of free space propagation by allowing the aperture dimensions to increase indefinitely. Okay, if we keep increasing the aperture dimension, then it would be like unobstructed illumination. Okay. For this, you will have to increase the uh, values of u and v or if we, you have to uh, go to, uh, if you have to extend u to 2 plus infinity and u 1 to minus in infinity. Similarly, you have to extend v 2 to plus infinity and v 1 to minus infinity. Now, making use of the fact that zeta infinity which is equal to f infinity is equal to half while zeta minus infinity which is equal to f minus infinity are equal to minus half. Okay. These are the tabulated value as I said earlier. At infinity, at plus infinity both zeta and f is equal to plus half while at minus infinity both zeta and f are equal to minus half. Okay. With this, we can calculate the irradiance at p using equation 60 and this will give us the irradiance due to unobstructed source. Okay. And if you substitute this value back here in the equation 60, then you see that you will uh, here get this value would be replaced by half, this value will be replaced by minus half. Similarly, this plus half this minus half okay, and this minus half minus of minus half will give you 1. Similarly, this bracket will also give you 1. Similarly, this bracket will give you 1 and this bracket will also give you 1. Okay. And if you add them up, you will get 1, 2, 3, 4. You will get 4 i u by 4 which is equal to i u and this is what you what is written here i p is equal to i u. Okay. It means things are calculated very well, yeah. things are uh, moving in a proper direction, in a correct direction. Because once we extended the boundaries of the aperture to infinity, then we uh, get irradiance at point P due to unobstructed point source. Okay. And since these two expressions are matching, we are in a correct line. Now, we need not to be very concerned about restricting the actual aperture size. Okay. Why? The contributions from wave front regions remote from O must be quite small, a condition attributable to the obliquity factor and the inverse R dependence of the amplitude of the secondary wavelets. Okay. This statement says that the aperture size does not play a very important role in uh, calculating the irradiance value at the point of observation p. Because if the aperture is a little big, the, as you increase the aperture size, the theta values goes up and therefore, the irradiance goes down. Therefore, the contributions from portions which are very far from the origin in aperture plane, they do not, that contribution is very small, very little. Okay. And in, in addition, as the wave propagate, R is there in the denominator if we consider the wave to be spherical. Okay. And therefore, the amplitude of the secondary wave decays down very rapidly. And therefore, the shape of the wave, the actual aperture shape is our actual aperture size does not play a major role. Okay. It is not of it should not be of too much of concern. Now, this is all about the rectangular aperture, although we solve equation 16 in a limiting case, but what if u 1, u 2 or v 1, v 2 are not equal to infinity plus infinity or minus inf infinity, then how to solve it? For this, we will have to go to some tabulated values of uh, these functions, 
but there is a very nice graphical method to solve these integrals or to have these values and what is this graphical method? This graphical method is called Carnot spiral. Mary Alfred Carnot devised a elegant geometrical depiction of the Fresnel integral and this geometrical uh, interpretation is almost similar to that of vibration curve. Okay. Carnot spiral is a plot of points B tilde W which is equal to zeta W plus I F W. As W takes on all possible values from 0 to plus minus infinity. Okay. And this function we have already seen in our previous slides. This is nothing but this integral equation number 56 you see zeta W plus I F W. And the only our motto of introducing zeta and f was to solve this integration. Okay. Now, this integration here in Carnot spiral is represented by this function b tilde okay. and here the independent variable w it is allowed to take any possible value values between 0 to plus minus infinity. Okay. This just means that we plot zeta w on horizontal or real axis and f w on vertical or imaginary axis. Okay. Now, if we in Carnot's spiral as is said here that it is a plot of b tilde and b is a complex number. So, how to plot a complex number? In the horizontal direction plot uh, real part of uh, this complex number while in the vertical direction plot imaginary part of this complex number or in other words on horizontal axis plot zeta while on the vertical axis, axis plot f and with this you get a set of points just with this set of points you can draw a curve which would n be nothing but Carnot spiral. Okay. Now, say that you have some spiral here okay, and say that there is a length element dl on this spiral. Now, this length element dl would be equal to square root of d zeta square plus d f square. dl is a length element which is measured along the curve and this length element would be equal to square root of d zeta square plus d f square yeah, which is very much obvious. Now, let us substitute the values of d zeta and d f because we know what is the expression of zeta and f. Zeta and f are given here in our previous slide by equation number 54 and equation number 55. Therefore, once zeta and f are given we will have to just differentiate them to get d zeta and d f. Now, with differentiation the integral sign will go away and we will have this expression cos square pi w square by 2 plus sin square pi w square by 2 into dw square. This is what we will get on the right hand side of this af after substitution in equation number 62. Yeah. What we did is that we substituted for d zeta square and df square. We know zeta is equal to integration of some parameter. Since we are differencing integration, the integral sign will go away okay. and this we will be left with these two terms. Now, we know that sin square theta plus cos square theta is equal to 1 then this therefore, this term would be equal to 1 and therefore, d l would be equal to d w okay, which means the values of w on the Carnot spiral will correspond to the arc length. Okay. Now, this is a representative figure of Carnot spiral. Okay, this is how a Carnot spiral look like on the horizontal axis zeta is plotted while in the vertical axis f is plotted. Zeta is the real part of b tilde while f is imaginary part of b tilde. Here on the vertical axis it is a imaginary part, it is a imaginary axis while the horizontal one is the real axis. Now, the values which you are seeing on the spiral it is w, yeah? make it a point. On the spiral we are plotting w okay? and the w values are marked by this dash line you can see here the value of w is 0 0.5 the value of w here is 1 
here it is a square root of 2, here it is 1.5. Similarly, on the other side, these are the values of w. Okay? And the spiral is going in this direction in the first quadrant while in it is going in this direction in the third quadrant. Okay? Now, as the value approaches plus minus infinity, yeah, you see that values of w is increasing in positive direction along this axis, along this spiral, while it, the values of w are increasing in negative direction in along this axis. Okay? Now, when w approaches plus minus infinity, the curve is spirals into its limiting value and what is its limiting value? We know the limiting value because when w is equal to plus either plus infinity or minus infinity, we know both zeta and f they become equal. Yeah? When w is plus infinity, zeta infinity is equal to half as well as f infinity is equal to half. Similarly, when w is equal to minus infinity, zeta infinity is equal to minus half and f w is equal to minus half. Yeah, let me write it here. Zeta plus infinity is equal to half, zeta minus infinity is equal to half, yeah, plus half. Whenever I am saying half, it is plus half. Similarly, f plus infinity is equal to half and f minus infinity is equal to minus half. Yeah, sorry, it should, it should be plus half here, yeah. Sorry, minus half here, yeah. The, these two terms are minus, while these two terms are plus. And we know that B tilde, this is equal to zeta plus iota f. Okay. Therefore, at w plus infinity or at w minus infinity, we can write the expression of b tilde. Now, at w plus infinity, b tilde value is given by b tilde plus, this is at w plus infinity. And th since this is equal to zeta plus i f and zeta at infinity is plus half as well as f at plus infinity is plus half. Therefore, this would be the expression for beta tilde plus at w is equal to plus infinity. Similarly, at w is equal to minus infinity, b tilde is given by b tilde minus and its value is given by minus half minus i by 2. Since this is these are the maximum or minimum possible values of uh, function beta tilde, therefore, the upper spiral when it rounds the, the, the ultimate value is b plus which is here and the ultimate value is b minus which is shown here. Okay. All these spirals ends here. Okay. This value is b tilde plus here and this value is b tilde minus. This is are the, the limiting values b tilde function. It is a b tilde is the limiting value and the limiting values are given by these two expressions. Now, if omega increases in the positive direction, this is how the b evolves, this is how b increases and after a while, while it spirals around and ultimately it reaches to b plus. Similarly, if w increases in minus direction, then this is how the b uh, evolves and it spirals and it ultimately reaches to b, b tilde minus. Okay? The values of zeta and f are expressed on the horizontal and vertical axis respectively. Now, let us now calculate the slope of this spiral. The slope would be given by d f by d zeta. Okay? We know the expressions, expressions for d f and d zeta which are used here substitute them here and this gives the slope tan pi w square by 2. This is the slope. Once the slope is given, then the angle between the tangent to the spiral at any point and the zeta axis would be given by pi w square by 2. Yeah, this is shown here in this figure. Okay? If you draw a tangent here, then this angle would be beta, which is the slope which is coming here while calculating the slope pi w square by 2. This is why it is said that the angle between the tangent to the spiral at any point 
and the zeta axis the horizontal axis is beta which is given by pi w square by 2 which we calculate here he calculated here in expression 63. Now let us consider uh, some realistic example okay let us consider the problem of a 2 nanometer square hole where this hole is illuminated by a light of wavelength 500 nanometer okay r naught is 4 nanometer and the illumination is done with a plane wave okay r naught means the point of observation p is at a distance 4 nanometer from the square hole okay now what is the motto we wish to find the irradiance at p directly opposite the aperture center where in in where in this case u1 is equal to minus 1 and u2 would be equal to plus 1. Why u1 is equal to minus 1 and u2 is equal to plus 1? Now, if this is our aperture, okay, this is our square aperture, okay, this is our z axis and this is our y axis. Now, if you go back and see the definition of y and uh, u1 and u2 then if you remember I said u is in the horizontal direction and v is in the vertical direction why because v is related to z and u is related to y therefore you would be pointing in this direction yeah this would be the u direction and this would be the v direction yeah now it is a uh, origin is at the center of this uh, at, cent at the center of this aperture is square aperture and we know that this square aperture is having sides which are equal to 2 nanometer. Therefore, this whole length would be 2, but if we want to write the coordinate then it would be plus minus 1, it would be plus 1 here in y direction. The y value here would be minus 1 okay, and the y value here would be would be would correspond to would equivalent to be plus 1. Okay. Now, let us again go back and see that if it is a plane of illumination, then this is how the u and v are calculated and with this calculation, we found that in this particular example u1 is equal to minus 1 and u2 is equal to plus 1. Okay, if you put the value of lambda, if, if you substitute the value of r0 in the expression which we just talked about, I mean uh, this expression, expression number 59, if you substitute the value of r0, substitute the value of lambda and the extremities of the square aperture, then you will get the values of u, u1, u1, u2 and v1, v2 which are, which would be given by minus 1 and plus 1. Okay, this is why I say that y is y correspond to minus 1 here and y correspond to plus 1 here or you can write u1 is equal to minus 1 for this point and for this point it is uh, equal to plus 1 we, and we call these two extremities as u1 and u2. Now as you saw before in the Carnot spiral the variable u r the variable w was being measured along the curve. Now, w was a generalized uh, variable. Now, since we are dealing with u here only, we will say that u is varying along the curve. Okay? The variable u is measured along the arc okay? and here what we have done, we have replaced w by u on the spiral. Okay? Right now we are just talking about the horizontal axis y axis and therefore we are just talking about the extremities which are here, extremities of the aperture which are in on the in the horizontal direction. Okay? The leftmost extremity is at point u1 is equal to minus 1 while the rightmost extremity is at a point where u2 is equal to plus 1. Okay? Now, once the values of u, u1 and u2 are known, we can put these values, we can mark them these values on the Carnot spiral. 
okay therefore we will place two points on the spiral at distances from the center of uh, this spiral which is os and which distances would be equal to u1 and u2 yeah now you know you see that in this aperture o which is origin is center of the aperture and therefore u1 and u2 are at a same distance okay they are situated at uh, at a same distance from the origin therefore u1 we can mark here and this distance represents the length of u1 and similarly we can mark u2 and this distance represents the length of u2 and since you, uh, mod of u1 is mod of u2 therefore these two distances would be equal okay do make it a point that u is varying along the curve along this arc okay once these points are placed okay having known the values of u1 we can mark u1 and this arc length would be equal to the length of u1 similarly this arc length would be equal to length of u2 u1 was on the left hand side or on the negative side of since u1 was on the negative uh, side of the origin o therefore we are marking u1 in third coordinate yeah it's going down and the positive value of u which is u2 is marked on uh, in first quadrant yeah because positive values of u are here measured in the first quadrant the u is zero at the center and it is uh, increasing in this direction and it is increasing in negatively in the other direction this we have already talked about okay now we label these two points as b1 tilde and b2 tilde okay because once u1 and u2 values are known we can calculate the values uh, value of b1 tilde and b2 tilde which was introduced here in this slide okay because carnot spiral is a plot of these points b tilde okay now once w is known we can mark these two points w here is replaced by u yeah already said and uh, these marking are shown in this figure okay b1 u is marked here while b2 is b2 u is marked here okay okay having done this we will now have to calculate the phasor b1 to tilde how to calculate phasor b1 to tilde to calculate phasor b1 to tilde we draw a line starting from b1 and then extending till b2 okay let us pick a different color for better clarity this phasor will represent b12 and it is drawn from b1 to b2 and it is nothing but a complex number and this complex number is b2 tilde minus b1 tilde okay and b12 is equal to zeta u plus if where uh, this uh, the limits is varying from u1 to u2 okay uh, this is the compressed expression of b2 minus b1 b2 tilde minus b2 b1 tilde and this exactly equation number 64 is first term in equation 53 where we were calculating the total field let us go to equation 53 now you see here in equation 53 this term is nothing but it is b12 tilde which is function of u and through carnot spiral we just saw that just by drawing a phasor b12 tilde we calculated this integral the first part in equation 53 we will repeat the same thing for the second integral also and there we will replace u by v yeah and this is what is done next okay similarly we will uh, till now this was our aperture and this was the origin okay u was extending in this direction and v was extending in this direction u was varying from minus 1 to plus 1 while v on the other hand it 
also varies from minus 1 to plus 1 ok, v is varying from minus 1 to plus 1 also yeah, therefore the values of v1 and v2 would be minus 1 and plus 1. Similarly, for these two values we can calculate v2 tilde minus v1 tilde on Carnot's spiral, we will have, we will draw the same Carnot's spiral, but here the variable u would be replaced by variable v ok. With that Carnot spiral we will again draw a phasor b12 which now will be function of v and that phasor will give you the second integral in equation number 53. Once the length of the two phasors are measured, the two integrals are solved and th therefore, from 53 we can calculate the resultant field at the point of observation p. Okay? The magnitude of these two complex numbers b12 b12 tilde u and b12 tilde v, they are just the length of appropriate b12 tilde phasors in the Carnot spiral. Yeah. Therefore, from equation 53, the irradiance can simply be written as i p is equal to i u y 4 mod of b12 tilde function of u whole square and multiplied by mod of u12 tilde function of v whole square. Okay, and here I u is the irradiance due to an obstructed source. Okay. Notice that the arc length along the spiral are proportional to the aperture's overall dimension in y z direction. Okay. Now, the arc lengths are given translated in u and v terms and u and v are given by plus 1 and minus 1. Okay, because these u and v were calculated from these values, the square of 2 nanometer size whole wavelength r naught. Now, if you change the size of the square, the u and v values will change and therefore, arc lengths which we drew on the Carnot spiral that will also change and that will effectively change the irradiance observed at the point of observation p or uh, uh, irradiance to be observed at the point of observation p. Yeah, the arc lengths are therefore constant. Okay, if the square size is fixed, if the aperture size is fixed, then the arc lengths are constant, regardless of the position of p in the plane of observation. Okay, you see that these arc lengths are function of size of the aperture only. They are not the function of position of point p. On the other hand, the phasor b12 tilde which is a function of u or phasor b12 tilde which is a function of v which spans the, the arc lengths are not constant okay? and they do de depend upon the location of p. b12 tilde the phasor do depend upon the location of p. Why do they depend upon the location of p? Because in b12 tilde definition you see yeah, we have zeta and f, okay, b12 tilde is equal to zeta plus i f and what are zeta and f? Let us go back again just to remind you, zeta and f are given by equation 54 and 55, okay, and here you see that this are, there are variables w which are involved here. Okay, and this w varies between the limits of these integrals and therefore, if you change the position of p, okay, the value of phasor will change the b 1 to tilde, yeah, because I uh, will reiterate it, this u and v, they are the uh, b, b 1 to tilde is function of u and v and in u and v, we have x and y, y and z, these are two variables. Now, if we shift the aperture in aperture plane under plane wave evolution uh, and our, if we shift uh, the origin in the aperture plane, the values of u and v will shift and why do we shift the u and v values or why we do we shift the origin? Because to uh, measure the off axis irradiance, the location of p is varied, 
and therefore u and v will vary and therefore the phasor will vary. But the size of the with the size of the aperture the arc length which is the difference between u values and v values are constant ok. Therefore, delta u and delta v which are the difference between u1, u2 and difference between v and v1, v2 respectively which represents the arc length in the Carnot spiral they are independent of the position of p ok while these phasors they do depend on the location of b, p and we will see it in the next slide how do they depend. Now, this is the Carnot spiral for this aperture ok. Now, initially suppose that the aperture is very small. Now, slowly what we do is that we slowly increase the size of the aperture, it is a square aperture and we slowly increasing the size of the aperture. Now, once suppose we started with this size ok, with this size we know what are the value of u1 here, what is the value of u2 here, similarly we know what is the value of v1 here and what is the value of v2 here ok and depending upon these values of u1, u2 and v1, v2 we can draw two such spirals. This spiral is drawn for u a similar spiral can be drawn for v ok because we are calculating two integrals and one spiral is drawn for one integral and the second second spiral is drawn for the second integral. Now, for u we represent u1 here and u2 here and then we draw this phasor and this phasor is nothing but the value of the the, the integral. Now, if you increase the size of the this square aperture slowly then what will happen is that this point u2 this will move in anti clockwise direction along this spiral. Similarly, the point u1 will also move in anti clockwise direction along this spiral ok, they both will move, they move in anti clockwise direction ok with the increasing size of the aperture. Why they will move in the such a way? Because with increasing size of the aperture the arc length will increase and what is arc length? Let me pick different color, this is our arc length, the blue color in this figure represents the arc length and this arc length is proportional to the size of the aperture. Now, in the horizontal direction where we are use, uh, measuring u, this is delta u, delta u is difference between u1 and u2. Now, if you increase the size, this delta u will increase and therefore, this arc length will increase, the blue one, ok, it will slowly go move towards the b plus tilde and b mi minus tilde values which are shown here ok, b minus tilde is here, b plus tilde is here which are the limiting values of, uh, of Carnot's spiral ok. Now, you see that the length of the phasor is this much here, but if the arc has or the arc has arc length has increased then the length of the phasor has now increased ok. What will happen if the arc is increased such that that the u, u1 has reached here and u2 has reached here. In this case the arc length will be this. Now, this arc length is much smaller than the other two arc lengths ok. Now, with this anti clockwise rotation of u1 and u2 or with increasing arc length the u1 and u2 will spiral around this Carnot and the phasor the length of the phasor therefore, will vary ok and this length of phasor will go through a series of maxima and minima and therefore, at the point of observation p with increasing size of the aperture we will see lar more uh, less uh, sometimes we will see less intensity and sometimes a more a series of maxima and minima will appear at the point of observation ok. And if the aperture is opened so widely that it reaches to infinity then in that particular case we will get 
a phasor which will be given by this line. It will start from point um, B tilde minus and it will reach to the limiting point B tilde plus. Okay. This green line represents the phasor for unobstructed source where the aperture has opened till infinity and the green line it is start here at point B tilde minus and it ends here at point B tilde plus. And we know at infinity this value of B tilde plus is 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 here yeah? and here it is minus 0 0.5 here again it is minus 0 0.5. Okay, and this is a line which is making an angle of 45 degree with the horizontal axis with the zeta axis. Okay. This was all about the widening of the aperture. Okay. The point of observation P was directly behind the center O, the origin O. Okay. There was a, it was directly behind this origin O and from there if you open up the uh, aperture then you see that uh, a series of maxima and minima appear at P. But what will happen if we scan the aperture off axis points? Okay. Question is we know the intensity fluctuations at on axis points, but what will happen if P is shifted to some off axis points? Okay, let us also think about this. Now say that we have a Carnot spiral and P is shifted on some off axis point and say that shift is along y axis. Okay. P is along y axis and this shift is in this direction. Okay. As we said before, shifting P is very uh, complex mathematically. Therefore, instead of shifting P on the left hand side, people prefer to shift the whole aperture on the right hand side and therefore, the new origin would be here. Okay. This would be new origin. Okay. With the shift of the aperture, the new origin would be shifted on the left hand side. Okay. Therefore, this point would be closer to the origin while this point would be farther to the origin. Okay this u1 would be closer to the origin and u2 would be farther to the to the origin okay with this understood initially this was our carnot's spiral okay and this was the arc length which we were getting with symmetric o okay now when o is shifted towards left along y axis, then u1 has reduced. You see the value of uh, new u1, it got reduced. Therefore, since this value of u1 got reduced, the new u1 will appear in a shorter distance from the origin OS here. Okay, this is the new origin, new u1, while new u2 will appear here because the distance of u2 got increased this u2 is now larger okay therefore u2 would be here and therefore this arc with the shift of origin towards left this arc will shift up okay if you shift the origin even more say the new origin now is here this is the new origin with this what will happen is that u2 will be shifted more towards the uh, higher side and u1 u1 would be shifted towards this direction and therefore when origin o is exactly at the edge of the aperture the u1 would be here and u2 would be here okay and then the new arc would be like this okay now if you shift the origin on in the shadow region then this arc will keep shifting in this uh, along this Carnot's spiral and a situation will come when everything will uh, be very close to the B plus tilde point and, it, and if you go very far in the shadow you will not get any intensity the arc length 
it will uh, keep rotating and the suppose ultimately when we are far in the uh, shadow region then this would be the arc length okay y your uh, u1 would be this and u2 would be this point and then if you draw the uh, the phaser the phaser will look something like this this would be the phaser okay and this size of the phaser is very small okay then therefore if you keep shifting in the shadow the phaser size will keep reducing okay and ultimately you will get negligible radiance at the point of observation p similarly if you go move the origin in this direction too you will get the similar pattern and this arc will shift here in this direction okay now the arc will spiral around this spiral the lower one okay and the same case will also happen if you move up or down in this aperture okay and there instead of uh, plotting u we will plot v yeah now if the aperture is completely opened out revealing an unobstructed wave then we already know u1 would be equal to v1 and that would be equal to minus infinity and then b11 tilde u would be b11 tilde v which would be equal to b minus tilde and similarly b2 u tilde would be equal to b2 tilde v this would be equal to b plus it means in this case this would be our points when the aperture is wide open and the this would be the final phaser now this phaser let me write again now this point is our b tilde plus and this point is b tilde minus now this phaser for an unobstructed source will start from b minus b minus tilde point and it will end at b plus tilde point okay and it will pass through the center of course here yeah? it will pass through the center os now what would be the length of this phaser and what would be the orientation of this phaser we know that this point and this point they are at 0.5 unit away from the origin similarly this point is at minus 0.5 and this point is minus 0.5 and from the geometry we can see that the orientation is 45 degree with the horizontal axis and it has you can also calculate the length and length is equal to square root of 2 okay because this length would be equal to square root of 0.5 this length the lower part length will again be equal to square root of 0.5 if you add them up then you will get a square root of 2 this would, would be the overall length of the this phaser okay therefore the expression for the phaser would be square root of 2 which is the amplitude and the phase part to the power i pi by 4 okay this is for u dependent phaser for v dependent phaser that is in other direction this would again be equal to square root of 2 to the power i pi by 4 okay these phasers are for uh, aperture which is extended till infinity that is equivalent to an unobstructed source and from here if you substitute them back to equation number 57 the resultant field would be u by 2 into square root of 2 e to the power i pi by 2 into square root of 2 e to the power i pi by 2 after multiplication you get e to the power i pi by 2 okay now if you uh, want to see equation number 57 let us go back and see this is the equation number 57 now with this if you want to calculate the irradiance then irradiance of unobstructed amp uh, irradiance would be equal to ep tilde into ep tilde star by 2 and we will have the unobstructed amplitude except for a pi by 2 phase discrepancy yeah because we will we know in the fresnel formalism we always get this pi by 2 phase discrepancy because everything here is being calculated from secondary sources and we know that the in fresnel um, formalism there is a pi by 2 phase difference between primary uh, wave and secondary wave 
and apart from this discrepancy everything is online and the intensity would be equal to the um, intensity at point of abjuration p would be equal to the intensity which uh, we usually calculate from the unobstructed source. With this I end today's lecture, thank you for uh, bearing with me, hope uh, you are um, getting uh, the concepts and uh, see you in the next class.